Thank you for joining us. My name is Anne Albert, and I am the CLAT Family Director for Public Programs at the Herbert D. Katz Center for Advanced Judaic Studies at the University of Pennsylvania. Welcome to another talk in our series on the Jewish law, on Jewish law and the US Constitution. This series, as you know, if you have been with us before for previous programs, is designed to build on the theme of this year's fellowship program here at the CAT Center, which is focused on modern Jewish legal culture, with this series in particular focusing on sites of interaction between the spheres of Jewish law and life and the American legal system and constitutional law. Today's program is the third to last in this series, which has been running since um, late November. And um, next week, we will host Professor Ann Daly thinking about abortion and religious liberty claims. And we'll finish out the season after that with Avi Shalom Westreich on legal treatments of new forms of family relationships. Before we get started, today. I also want to, since we're coming towards the end of this series, I want to call your attention to two other sets of programs that we do have coming up from the CAT Center. The first is a series of three talks on archaeology and ancient Jewish life that we're producing in partnership with the Penn Museum here in Philly and at Penn. Those talks begin on February 22nd, and they'll run once a month, not once a week as these have. Um, Finally, we've just yesterday opened registration for our spring mini course. This is a three week small group experience with a chance to interact directly with the speaker, not like the webinar that you're in right now. Um, and the topic for that course is Halakha in the Modern World, How Jewish Law Was Rethought and Reworked in Modernity, taught by Yonatan Brafman. And that starts on May 4th, so you have plenty of time to register. OK, I also need and want to thank the appropriate thankable people. So I need to thank the Clapp family and the Harry Stern Family Foundation, whose gifts made this programming possible. Also the Katz family and the rest of our board of advisors and the many other donors who support this work. As usual, also, I personally thank all my colleagues here at the Katz Center who make things run, especially on these programs, Diana Dennis-Walters, Brian Lipscomb, and Miriam Saperstein. For this series, we are also really, really fortunate to have amazing partners in Penn's Cary Law School who have worked with us to make these programs available for continuing legal education credit. So on that note, I need to make an announcement at the start and end of the program for those who are doing this for credit as attorneys. So now is the time to listen up for your passwords if you're doing it. If you're not, uh, just bear with me for a moment. So. To those who are participating, please note that CLE passwords will be announced twice during this hour. You should write them down and enter them on your digital evaluation form after the event is over. The passwords will tell them how long you attended. The first password announcing right now is corporation. The evaluation form is mandatory to receive CLE credit, and that link should have been emailed to you in your confirmation email when you registered for CLE. If you didn't receive it, you'll find the link to that form in the chat. Um, do note that the CLE credit registration was different from the one to join this Zoom. So if you need that CLE registration, you can find it um, on our website on the event listing for this. So once again, the very first password is corporation couple of other short notes. This program is being recorded and along with our other public lectures for the season, it will be posted in about a week's time to the CAT Center's YouTube channel and you'll find a link to that in the chat. As always, we invite you and encourage you to submit questions anytime during the hour using the Q&A function in the bottom of your Zoom window. Um, if we have time remaining after the talk, I'll moderate a discussion with the speaker from your questions. So please do engage there. All right, without further ado, I will introduce today's speaker. We are really in for something special today. Um, we're joined by Winifred Fowler Sullivan, who is and has been a, really a leading voice in thinking about religion and law, religion and the state. 
She is currently Provost Professor of Religious Studies, Affiliate Professor of Law at the Moore School of Law, and Co-Director of the Center for Religion and the Human at all at Indiana University Bloomington. Her training is in both law and religion. So she went to law school and practiced law before returning to graduate school to study American religious history and the comparative study of religion. And her research, writing, and teaching has focused over the past few decades on various intersections of these fields, especially in the study of American religion and socio-legal and critical legal studies. You may be hearing, because this is a series about uh, Jewish law, that Judaism and Jewish contexts aren't particularly fronted in that, in, um, that research. However, um, we, this is one of these cases of a marvelous application of a body of work to, to the Jewish context, and I, I think it's going to be fantastic. So um, Winnie's books, both authored and edited, have approached this general topic from a range of angles and really have had a wide impact on the field. I'll just say there are really a lot, and it's quite impressive body of work. I'll just mention a few that are relevant to, to this talk, and you all can check them out on your own. A number of them analyze legal discourses about religion in the context of the religion clauses of the First Amendment. So starting in 1994, paying the words extra religious discourse in the Supreme Court of the United States. Following that in 2005, the impossibility of religious freedom. In 2009, prison religion, faith-based reform and the constitution. And then just recently in 2020, church state corporation construing religion in US law. Um, I will leave it there. I know that you all can go and find all of the many other works of Winnie Sullivan that are that are relevant to this talk today. And just now pass things on to you. The mic is yours. Thank you very much, Anne. Uh, thank you for inviting me the, to this series and thank you all for coming. Um, as Anne mentioned, and as will be immediately obvious to those of you here today, I have no expertise in Jewish law. And in fact, I will talk um, very little about Judaism. I will talk about the context in which um, all religion in the US operates legally. And one in which it has a, a particular poignancy given uh, Jewish history. And I'll talk a little bit about that, but I partly want to set a, up a question for you about uh, this context. So, um, as I said, I have no expertise in Jewish law. I do know something about the constitution, but my own writing has focused on what religion, more generally speaking, has come to mean in the jurisprudence and popular discourse of constitutionalism in the US. It has been my concern that the word religion as a legal matter has become increasingly more and more unstable and incoherent over the last couple of centuries, no longer implying a referent which we can agree on as a basis for our religious politics. There are many reasons for this incoherence, but I do think that one strategy is to return to more specific language, more specific, if not always more inclusive in our contemporary sense. An older rubric for these questions was church and state. Some decades ago, we broadened out those words to religion and law in order to encompass and include a broader range of religious traditions and legal cultures. I think that gesture was helpful and it has generated a lot of interesting scholarship and a new politics. But this strategy of avoidance has also obscured, I think, the ways in which our own jurisprudence continues to be bound to the older formulation. So today I will speak of the church, the state and the corporation and their interdependence. Finding our way to inclusion and greater toleration will only follow coming to grips with the ways in which this past is embedded in our law. I do want to acknowledge here at the beginning that there is an offense, I think, in my speaking, insisting of speaking of church here in this place. The church and the synagogue are deeply encoded in the history of the creation of the modern state. We will not have time to discuss that history today. Many of you will know it better than I do. It is still with us though, and haunts uh, the conversation we'll have today, another time perhaps. 
So to begin, to me, the most distinctive aspect of the legal framing of religion in the US is the mandate not to establish religion and the unintended consequences of that framing. The First Amendment to the US Constitution says that Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Not very many words. It seems quite simple and straightforward. The First Amendment religion clauses offer guarantees similar to those of other national and international instruments concerning religious freedom. It is the injunction against establishment that sets it apart and presents us with the challenge. How are we to protect the free exercise of religion without establishing it? Any effort to institutionalize or even to define the religious field sufficiently to protect it or even to separate it or regulate it always risks a charge of establishment. Any privileging of religion risks a charge of a denial of free exercise. At the extreme, the argument can and has been made that after disestablishment, organized religion is of no special legal consequence in the US, that religion is an entirely individual matter. Even that churches and other religious organizations should not constitutionally be recognized in law for any purpose. Yet, as I said, how can the free exercise of religion be protected if religion as a collective project cannot be acknowledged? This legal paradox has arguably created a particularly ragged religious field in the US, comparatively speaking, if you look at other countries. It has created a free and at times violent religion. This afternoon, I will describe the thesis of my most recent book, one that tries to think through disestablishment by focusing on the figure of the church and its surprising endurance in the American legal imagination, notwithstanding, as I've just said, its firm dismissal in the religion clauses. After a brief introduction, I will offer a close reading of the US Supreme Court's 2012 unanimous opinion in Hosanna Tabor versus EEOC an opinion whose significance, I will argue, has been overshadowed by attention to the subsequent Hobby Lobby decision. I will then read Hobby Lobby in light of Hosanna Tabor. In my view, the controversial and contested religion jur jurisprudence in the US reflects, among other things, a tragic American inability to find ways to come together for communal projects of various kinds on myriad fronts education, healthcare, environmental stewardship, and global citizenship. And this inability, it is, seems to me, is partly tied to this endurance of the church. Nancy Levine in her book, Powers of Distinction, insists that all human life takes place in collectivities. The question, she says, is how to value them. In asking how to value them, I take her to mean at once how to evaluate them and how to cherish them. She embodies the tension of this dual modern task in the story of Abraham, boldly claiming him as the exemplar of the modern. Modernity is Abram, she says, insofar as he leaves his kin and clan, his land for another land. This event makes him Abraham, father of a multitude. The call is not only that he leave his land, it is that he leave his land for another one. In leaving his land, he is going somewhere and not nowhere, not toward an abstraction or toward the Empyrean or simply to wander the earth. But then the new land, the promised land, will be no less subject to the original call that it did not become yet another homeland. Maternity is a reformation of the collective, she says. So in this specific context of the US, I want to say that the work of the reformation of the collective is in part articulated through the ongoing impossible task of realizing the constitutional commitment to non-establishment of religion. Law recognizes the collective in various ways, of course. 
the family, the university, the corporation, the trade union, as well as the state. Each has legal personality. Each is in law more than the sum of their parts. Like Levine, law makes an existent, ex existential claim about the collective. The embodiment of that claim is phenomenologically present in law. So the legal fiction of the collective contains a surplus. It is not simply the accumulation of the individual projects of its members. The collective itself has real effects in law. But insofar as they are modern, they are also always in process of reformation, as Nancy Levine says. So one of those collectives is and has been the church. So let me start by introducing you to the figure of the church in law in the US today. The 2012 US Supreme Court decision in Hosanna Tabor versus EEOC originated in an action brought by the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission on behalf of a fourth grade teacher, Cheryl Parrish. The EEOC alleged that her firing had constituted a retaliatory determination in violation of the Americans with Disabilities Act. The school at which she had taught, the Hosanna Tabor Evangelical Lutheran School in Redford, Michigan, sought dismissal of the action on the ground that the federal court lacked jurisdiction over the matter. Their employment relationship with Parrish was, they said, an ecclesiastical matter exempt from secular legal oversight. So while Parrish taught state mandated secular subjects to fourth graders, after her first year at the school, she had qualified to be what they called a called teacher. Being called for these Lutherans requires completion of a theological course as well as election by a church congregation and gives you a sort of tenure. Those they called lay teachers at the school are hired on year to year contracts. Importantly, both called and lay fourth grade teachers at the school had the same teaching duties. They just had different contractual relationships with the school and with the church community. And the school did not require either lay or called teachers to be Lutherans, and more than half of the students were not Lutheran. So after five years teaching at the school, Ms. Parrish had fallen ill over the summer of 2004 from an undiagnosed chronic illness and had taken a disability leave from her job at the beginning of that fall. When she sought to return to her classroom in January with her doctor's letter in hand, declaring that she was being effectively treated, the school refused to accept her back. They asked her to seek a peaceful release from her call using an internal church dispute resolution process. She asserted her rights under disability law and was subsequently fired for insubordination. The school faulted her for what they called going to law, citing the first letter of Paul to the Corinthians. After investigation of her complaint, the EEOC brought suit against the school on her behalf in the US District Court for the Eastern District of Michigan, arguing that her firing was retaliatory, a very serious charge. The school, as I said, won in the district court, but lost in the Court of Appeals. The US Supreme Court agreed to hear the case because it presented a new constitutional question about the reach of laws guaranteeing the rights of employees of religious organizations. While the justices stopped short of endorsing the school's strong assertion of the kind of exclusive sovereignty over its employees recognized as jurisdictional by the district court, they did reverse the Court of Appeals and fine for the school in a unanimous decision. Both religion clauses, they said, bar the government from interfering with the decision of a religious group to fire one of its ministers. This rule is known as the ministerial exception. The court deferred to the church in the judgment that Parrish qualified as a minister for purposes of the now constitutionally mandated ministerial exception and therefore had no rights under the Americans with Disabilities Act to have the legality of her dismissal considered in court. 
So does this mean that the US Supreme Court unanimously acknowledged that the church in some sense is a sovereign with its own monopoly on law? Was Ms. Parrish a minister? The difficulty of deciding between the finding of the Court of Appeals that her work was essentially secular on the one hand and that of the Supreme Court that it was religious on the other reflects a deep ambiguity in US law about what counts as religious and who decides. Much First Amendment jurisprudence derives its incoherence from this ambiguity. But what interests me about this decision is the court's strong and unanimous assertion of the rights of what they called the church. The last sentence of Chief Justice Roberts' opinion in the Hosanna Tabor case announces the dogma that binds the court. Affirming for the first time the constitutional status of the ministerial exception, the Chief Justice declared that the church must be free to choose those who will guide it on its way. I was startled when I first read those words. Where is this mandate to be found? The church does not appear in the US Constitution. In any event, I asked myself, is it constitutional for the US Supreme Court to use the definite article when speaking of church? To what can it possibly be referring when it says the church? And why exactly must the church be free to choose her ministers? If one goes back and rereads Justice Roberts's opinion in light of his last sentence, it becomes clear that when he speaks of the church and its prerogatives, he is not speaking only of the Hosanna Tabor Missouri Synod Evangelical Church in Redford, Michigan, or of the Lutheran Church more generally. Several pages earlier, in describing the purpose of the ministerial exception, Roberts says that the ministerial exception ensures that the authority to select and control who will minister to the faithful, a matter he says strictly ecclesiastical, is the church's alone, not a church or a religious group or association, but the church. Given the historical argument that the court then mobilizes to support this rule, I do not think it is too far-fetched to say that the court is speaking here of what is known to Christians as the body of Christ, a common metaphor for the church as a mystical, even sovereign entity. Indeed, the church figures throughout the opinion for the court in Hosanna Tibor as an opaque but necessary carrier for the transhistorical permanence and significance of the right kind of religion and of its God-given rights to select its own ministers, a matter as it continually insists, strictly ecclesiastical. The Chief Justice's assertion concerning the church's right to choose its ministers is supported in the opinion by a curious mashup of medieval and early modern religious and political history, as well as a sprinkling of its prior decisions. He begins oracularly, Controversy between church and state over religious offices is hardly new. Wait, I want to say, is this a controversy between church and state? Do we have a church and a state in the US? Didn't the founding fathers reject that history? And what law governs the relationship between church and state implied here? A strong argument can be made, I think, that we have neither a church nor a state in the sense of implied by this reference to the medieval investiture controversy. But Roberts apparently needs both in order to establish the semi-sovereignty of the church in law. He begins his story in England in 1215. That alone is surprising. Wasn't the world created anew on July 4th, 1776? Before the Act of Supremacy, we are told, passed by the English Parliament in 1534, making Henry VIII head of the church, the church in England had been free at least since 1215, thanks to King John and Magna Carta. The church was free during those three centuries, Robert says, because King John had affirmed in Magna Carta that the church had the freedom of election to church offices. Henry VIII, with his break from Rome, had interrupted the freedom recognized by King John. 
The church was not free again then, according to Roberts, until the Puritans and the Quakers arrived in the New World. There, far from the control of the king, Americans adopted the First Amendment and ensured the continuation of John's promise. Really, Hosanna Tibor Evangelical Lutheran Church in Redford, Michigan has rights granted to the church by King John? That was a very different church, wasn't it? That was the medieval church. That was the church in Rome. Martin Luther specifically rejected the prerogatives claimed by that church, and the followers of John Calvin stripped the altars. And it was a different kind of state as well. 800 years of church history and profound differences in Roman Catholic, Reformation, and Anabaptist theories of church, as well as understandings of the freedom of Christians, are finessed in the court's breezy historical account. King John, Henry VIII, James Madison, and William Penn, members of very different churches with radically different understandings of church polity, are all mobilized on behalf of the same special freedom for the church. But history mostly stops for the Chief Justice in 1791. After his loose account of English church history, what is most striking in his opinion is the entire lack of acknowledgement of the remarkable changes to religion that occurred in the US after the revolution. Disestablishment, division, revivalism, populism, innovation and immigration profoundly changed American religion. American officials, when speaking of American religion, can no longer speak accurately or even arguably constitutionally, as the court does in Hosanna Tabor, of the church and her rights. The church was left behind in the old world, in the long struggle between church and state. The state won, didn't it? And in the United States, it was the people who took control of both. Having historically established the church as having rights, Chief Justice Roberts then turned to deal with the most important precedent for the position claimed by Parrish and the EEOC. That was the court's 1990 decision in Employment Division versus Smith. Smith, known as the Peyote case, had held that the Free Exercise Clause of the First Amendment protects only opinions, not acts, and therefore does not mandate a constitutional exemption for the actions of religiously motivated persons from neutral laws of general application that make such acts illegal. To require such an exemption or accommodation from law would mean, as Justice Scalia had explained in his opinion for the majority in Smith, that each person would be a law unto himself, free to assert the bar of religious conscience for any refusal to observe the law. The Smith precedent had been considered by many court observers to be the most serious legal obstacle for the defendants in Hosanna Tabor. The Americans with Disabilities Act is surely a neutral law of general application, and thus, under Smith, no accommodation under the Free Exercise Clause appeared to be available to the Michigan school. In other words, the church might believe whatever it liked about the rights of the disabled and the sinfulness of going to law, but without a statutory exemption, it had to obey the same law as everyone else. Not so, said Roberts. The Smith rule did not apply in Hosanna Tibor, he said, because the issue before the court was not a claim to a special accommodation by an individual, as with the Smith plaintiff's objection to the prohibition against their sacred use of certain narcotics. It was rather a claim by the church to administer its own laws. Roberts explained this difference in a short paragraph which has baffled many readers. It is true, he said, that the ADA's prohibition on retaliation, like Oregon's prohibition on peyote use, is a valid and neutral law of general applicability. But he insisted, a church's selection of its ministers is unlike an individual's ingestion of peyote. The Smith case, he said, involved government regulation of only outward physical acts. Hosanna Tibor, in contrast, concerned government interference with an internal church decision that affects, he said, 
the faith and mission of the church itself. It is worth considering this paragraph very, very carefully. What the US court says here is that while the free exercise clause provides no mandated accommodation in law for outward physical acts engaged in by individual believers, the US constitution does require such an accommodation for acts of the church because government interference with internal church governance affects the faith and mission of the church itself. The distinction the court is making here is not entirely clear, but it does seem to draw the court into a very thorny theological conversation, as well as to anticipate the question of corporate personhood considered in the Hobby Lobby decision to which we shall turn next. Roberts describes the religious acts in the Smith case, Native American sacramental consumption of peyote as only outward, while the church's acts in Hosanna Tabor, the disciplining of an employee are understood to be internal and therefore more essential. Indeed, in a semantic shift from speaking of a church in the second sentence of the paragraph to speaking of the church in the third, it is the universal church rather than the individual believer on the court's reading who seems to be recognized as having an internal life of consequence. Douglas Laycock, a well-known First Amendment scholar who represented Hosanna Tabor, had explained to the justices during argument, oral argument that the church should be understood as being prior to the sacraments because the church forms the consciences of individuals. Laycock also insisted that church and state are separate and equal jurisdictions. He said in oral argument that, quote, the churches do not set the criteria for selecting or removing the officers of government, and government does not set the criteria for selecting and removing officers of the church. These decisions are committed to churches by separation of church and state. It's not that institutions are different from individuals, he said. It is that the institutional governance of the church is at a prior step. Individually motivated religious acts are termed by Laycock and by the court as outside of, perhaps in fact threatening to the very order of the faith and mission of the church itself, as well as of the state. Those acts must therefore bow to secular law as well as to religious law. In other words, according to the court in Hosanna Tabor, the church, unlike an individual, is a law unto itself. This is a classic example of the church and state together regulating membership through the naming of heretics. In this case, Karen Perich, a naming always both religious and political. So how do we explain the US court's peculiar solicitude for the church's faith and mission over the conscience of the individual and its move in distinguishing Smith to put church order before sacrament? I don't think it's enough to say that the court is evincing a bias for Christianity, although that is true. The church is far more embedded than that. What the court is doing here in conjuring the church is reading the constitutional collective through a particular Christian theory of the relationship over time of the human and the divine. The theology of the church and its relationship to the political order has been a matter of intense interest to Christians since the early councils. But as the story goes for this American court, it was particularly so during the investiture struggle of the Middle Ages and the early modern period in England, affecting politics as well as religion. This is a complex story. I would draw out one thread here, borrowing from historian Ernst Kantorowicz's, Ernst Kantorowicz. In his book, The King's Two Body, Kantorowicz famously described the transformation of theories of divine kingship over the course of the Middle Ages, showing how, as the modern nation state was born, European political regimes can be seen to have made powerful use of the metaphors of the Trinity and of Christ's dual nature, as the mystical bodies of the church were juridified and transferred to successive monarchies. 
A key turning point for Kantorowicz came with the invention of the Tudor legal fiction of the king's two bodies. The king now having replaced Christ as the metaphorical center of political power. Kantorowicz argues that it was the reduction of the three bodies to two and the eventual violent separation of the king's earthly and divine bodies with the beheading of Charles I that made secular democratic government possible. The great French theologian Henri de Lubac, who was one of the architects of the modernization of the Catholic Church in Vatican II, saw this same process as having had had a pernicious effect on the church not because it was deprived of influence or because it was surpassed by the state, but because the church itself was secularized through its centuries of rivalry with the state. Its body too was juridified, but it was also desacralized. De Lubac and the bishops of the Second Vatican Council sought to reclaim and distinguish the unity and sacrality of Christ's two bodies from the secular order. I am of course here leaving out other church histories, those of the Eastern churches and of the Protestant reformations, not to mention much diversity within the Catholic traditions, as well as the further bodily transformations of all of them in the Atlantic crossing and thereafter. Some of those churches come in other chapters in my book, but reading Hosanna Tibor by way of de Lubac and Kondorowicz can help us to see, I think, that in the particular way in which the court distinguishes Smith, the court is enacting yet one more transformation of the corpus mysticum. By granting a kind of sovereignty to the church and by separating church and sacrament, the church is once more being recognized as a secular political entity, just as de Lubac feared, one with its own exclusive jurisdiction. One might even go so far as to say that the Supreme Court not only endangered its own precedence in its treatment of the Smith decision, it can also be seen to have reversed Vatican II's theology of the church, returning to an earlier scholastic political theology, one which underwrote a church seeking worldly power as a rival to the state. This scholasticism is now favored by conservatives in the church and apparently on the bench, both Catholics and non-Catholics indeed arguably by the entire court. Does it matter that the court gets its history wrong? I have a friend who says that mocking the court's historical musings in this way is easy pickings. I concede his point, but I do think it matters. By reading its version of church history into the First Amendment, by returning to what it takes to have been the Church of King John, the court in the Hosanna Tabor case recognized the importance of the religious community over the individual. In Levine's words, it valued the collective, but it did not evaluate it. And what of those who, did not, who do not belong to churches? While other religious communities speak of a collective identity in various equally complex ways, the court's opinion would seem to suggest that US constitutional rights are tightly and very specifically bound to a history and theology of the Christian church. While the court acknowledges that it might occasionally prove difficult to decide who qualifies as a minister for the purposes of this new doctrine, it nowhere acknowledges even the possibility of non-Christians. This is very troubling. The church in its claim to universality is arguably by some definitions a necessarily supersessionist institution. Its very creation in the mission to the Gentiles is said to have resulted from the refusal of the Jews to recognize Jesus as Messiah. Its continuing indispensability to the court arguably draws power from this same well. So Hosanna Tabor's strong affirmation of the collective of church sovereignty was further entrenched in the court's subsequent decision granting an exemption from the Affordable Care Act's contraceptive mandate to three business corporations, including Hobby Lobby, a retail outlet selling products for home crafts. As in Hosanna Tabor, the Hobby Lobby decision honored the religious rights of the corporate over the individual, granting the corporate religious entity a power to resist the law allowing it a kind of sovereignty again, 
one that was denied to individuals within it. Don Verrilli, representing the government in, in his oral argument in Hobby Lobby, commented on the status of religious exemptions for religious organizations, referring to that special solicitude which the court recognized in Hosanna Tabor. Michael McConnell, a senior religion clause scholar in the US, in his amicus brief on behalf of religious publishers filed in the Hobby Lobby case, also cited Hosanna Tabor, saying of the court's decision, it is not too much to say that the decision augurs a new birth of freedom for the religious communities of America. Is Hobby Lobby a religious organization or community? Is it a church? Both McConnell and Verrilli speak generally of religious communities or religious organizations, but I want to insist that what they are talking about is the church. It is the church that the court recognizes in Hobby Lobby, just as it did in Hosanna Tabor. It is the corporation as church that grounds the religious status of opposition to abortifacients for the court. This notwithstanding the fact that as Joan Scott and Mary Griffith and others have demonstrated, demonstrated. Opposition to women's bodily autonomy has not ever been the exclusive province of religion. Secularists have been as much at fault. And the particular Christians at issue in Hobby Lobby, Mennonites and Pentecostals, have not always opposed abortion. I don't have time here to make this argument in full, but I draw in my book on new scholarship about the nature and history of the corporation. One question for legal historians has been whether the corporation should be thought of as merely a contractual arrangement, a creature of law reducible to the economic interests and activities of those who own and control it. Parallel, in other words, one might say to low church understandings of church. Or is it something more, an entity of its own, more in other words than the sum of its parts? While the long history of the, of the corporate form might be traced back to medieval guilds and towns or further into Roman law antecedents, by the end of the 19th century in the US, as the number of corporations increased and corporate power became palpable, a new idea that corporations were real entities took its place, influenced by European legal theorists such as Otto Gierke and William Maitland. The entity theory of corporations has also enjoyed something of a renaissance with political and cultural his historians of the East India Company. At various points in its almost four century existence, the East India Company drafted its own laws, had its own courts, printed its own currency, engaged in treaty making and exercised milita military authority over populations. Geographer Joshua Barkin traces the sovereign powers of the modern corporation and its legally sanctioned immunity from law to this early history, adding policing and the right to decide who lives and dies to the list of its extra legal powers. Corporations today, he argues, increasingly do all the work of the state, education, punishment, war making, arbitration, and of course, the provision of health care. The key to understanding corporate power, according to Barkin, is understanding the tragedy of its doubleness. In its collectivity, the corporation both empowers and oppresses the individual. It is further embedded in a web of bourgeois capitalist commitments that determine its imaginary. Sounds like the church. Well, Justice Alito, in his decision for the majority in Hobby Lobby, pays lip service to the idea that any rights enjoyed by Hobby Lobby are traceable to the rights of the owners in a kind of pass-through theory of the corporation. He also continually recognizes the corporate plaintiffs in the Hobby Lobby case as having personalities and capacities independent of those of their owners. The plaintiff companies are characterized by Alito as having missions ethical obligations and religious commitments. The dissenters engage in the same semantic blurring. Corporations are repeatedly described by both Alito and the dissenters as having religious reasons and as believing. We are encouraged to understand them as having religious consciences, constitutionally protected religious consciences that deserve our respect, like the church. 
The court seems to think that it can solve the problem of religion through jurisdictional thinking, attempting to reserve to the church that which is strictly ecclesiastical. There is also a strong sense in these cases and those that they cite in which there is now a profound interchangeability and equality among the church, the state, and the corporation in US law, all cooperating to enclose and discipline the individual. I hope in this brief sketch, I have persuaded, persuaded you that notwithstanding disestablishment, the church is very much present in US law today. In my book, I also consider other church avatars in law, including the curious appearance of the Russian patriarch being granted rights to property in Manhattan over lay US Orthodox claimants at the height of the Cold War, as well as the troubling career of the black church in law and its instrumentalization in the criminal justice system, using a recent study of the Baptist Seminary in the Louisiana State Penitentiary at Angola. US law does not seem to be able to think religion without the church. And yet the church they invoke is also largely a fantasy, a creature of their own imagining. Actual religious Americans live their collective lives in other ways. Lutherans, Mennonites, Pentecostals, Russian Orthodox, and African Americans, among many, many others, lead religious lives vastly different from those represented by the court. In my last chapter, I try to conjure a church in law that might be otherwise through a reading of the Masterpiece Cake Shop case. The epigraph for this last chapter is a photograph I took of a sculpture by Philadelphia artist, Lori Payne. I encountered her work, two figures, beautiful renderings of rag dolls of 19th century African-American women in the museum at Mother Bethel AME Church in Philadelphia a church many of you will know. To me, these sculptures, one said to be of an enslaved woman and the other one of a free black woman, give powerful and ambiguous witness to the life of the church, of an alternative church in law. Mother Bethel was founded in 1794 by African-Americans who left St. George's Methodist Church because of racial discrimination to found what is often taken to be one of the first African-American led churches. During an impromptu visit to the church, we were shown around the sanctuary and invited to come back to worship by a minister of the church. We then, we then went down into a crypt. The crypt holds the remains of the Reverend, Reverend Richard Allen and his wife, Sarah Allen, founders of the African Methodist Episcopal denomination, as well as a small museum. These two sculptures inhabit an old fashioned museum case, wooden with glass windows. Confined yet honored, separated and yet together, the two women call you out. If we take Nancy Levine's challenge seriously, we have no choice but to be corporate. On her reading, we do have a choice to be corporate in ways not imagined by the US Supreme Court. I want to underscore here at the end that the court's decision in Hosanna Tibor was unanimous including the women justices and the Jewish justices. All of them affirmed the rights of the church in American law. In my view, we cannot look to the Supreme Court for solutions to our impasse on religious freedom. I look forward to your questions. Thank you so much. That was extraordinary. Um, I see that people are still processing as I have been. There is a, really a lot to think about here. I will say, um, I'll bring one of my own first questions and there's one question also already and everyone else, please, um, please start commenting. Um, my first reaction, I must say is, you know, you, you, I think you only said the word Jewish once at the end, speaking about Jewish justices, right? We talked about this beforehand. To the ears of a Jewish historian, which I am, there's much in what you're talking about that resonates with narratives of, of Jewish history. One common narrative being that Jews before modernity existed as a kind of comp corporation and that the ideal state there was that Jews were governing themselves according to their own law, ideally without intervention by outsiders, right? But the narrative there is that that was ended or at least profoundly disrupted 
in ways that have meant much to the Jewish experience with modernity, right? So now it's jarring <laughs> to hear an account of a similar claim being made for churches in our in our contemporary moment. So I wonder if you could speak to that a little bit, to that history um, and to the way in which a, a, a synagogue to, to, to counteract the ecclesia or a synagogue to counteract the church might play into such a vision. As you know, this is a really, really long and interesting and tangled question. and, and in, terribly important. I mean, um, you know, in the Ecclesia and Synagoga also, as you know, became um, physical sculptures of women that were um, displayed in the medieval period. Um, and over the course of that time, maybe beginning uh, as equals as representation of, a, of a, an inheritance that Christians and Jews shared, but came over the medieval period to in which synagogue became subordinate to even um, uh, severely oppressed by ecclesia. Um, so, I mean, that's that's one aspect of the history. I think that, um, and of course, then when you come more closer in terms of modernity, you know, one of the challenges of this is when are we actually starting this modernity thing? <laughs> you know, are we starting it, uh, you know, uh, with the Reformation or earlier with the, you know, rediscovering of Roman law in the 12th century? That's where legal historians might start in terms of the sort of buildup of the bureaucratic church and the bureaucratic state and their kind of twinning, which I think is, is, is what we're seeing here. And in and a twinning which excludes synagogue, I think. Um, and maybe that I'll just stop there for a minute. Okay, that's a great place to stop. And I now now the questions are pouring in. And so I want to group a few of them, which are asking in various ways about the the, the sort of realities of such cases um, for the Jewish world or su such decisions for the Jewish world in America today. So for example, one person is asking about a case that you may or may not be familiar with, um, Gru Scott versus Milwaukee Jewish Day School. Um, another person is asking about the Jewish justices and on the court and um, their relationship to this way of thinking. Um, and then there's one scenario that I want to just present to you, and maybe you could sort of talk about all of this at once if you're able. Um, the scenario um, that this person presents is an Orthodox synagogue wishing to appoint only a male rabbi and being sued by a female candidate for discrimination, right? And the synagogue might in return claim that it needs a male rabbi for religious reasons. Would that be approached in the same way? by the court um, or would it be um, somehow excluded because we're not talking about the church here? So I, I think that it would be likely, I think there've already been some Jewish cases um, in which um, Jewish uh, religious employees were recognized as ministers. So um, for sure that, that will be what's happening. Um, I might say it a little more strongly that in this case, um, the Jewish congregation is effectively being a church, being recognized as a church. And so it accepts those privileges as a church, I would say. You know, in terms of the Jewish justices, you know, Justice Ginsburg in particular, um, it's very interesting, her dissent in, uh, in Hobby Lobby, um, you know, she very strongly affirms what she takes to be the appropriate rights of women's Catholic religious orders. And in fact, she's more churchy even than the conservatives you might argue. So it, it looks to somebody who studies religion as if the more sort of institutionalized Catholic uh, religion gets recognized, whereas 
the kind of Pentecostal religion that would be represented and Mennonite uh, sort of low church uh, traditions uh, do not look religious enough to her. So ironically, perhaps she seems even more churchy than some of the conservatives. There is so much to unpack here and we only have a few minutes. Before I forget, I need to say the second CLE password, which ears up all the CLE participants. <laughs> the second password is freedom. Um, so there you go for that. I'll just, I think the way to end our questions, even though really we could talk for another hour, I think, is um, to ask if you could say a little bit more about the alternative models of corporate identification that you mentioned at the end. I know that's not a two minute question or a, maybe even a 10 minute question, but could you expand a little bit on what you're talking about? Because I think that your presentation leaves people hungry for thinking anew about this issue. Yeah, I mean, I think it does, um, it does involve some, you know, what you might call uh, utopian thinking. Um, I think that, um, you know, in talking about um, the Masterpiece Cake Shop case, you know, I tried to stage a certain uh, scenario in which Anthony Bourdain came and uh, filmed his show in the cake shop and sort of brought everybody together for a sort of visionary experience of imagining community. Otherwise, a situation in one in which, you know, a person, a, a church going Christian could say directly to the baker, but doesn't Jesus say we should eat with sinners or something like that? Or to just say even more broadly that all religious communities um, teach hosp table hospitality and um, and fellowship and finding a way to that kind of con conversation, which is something that of course is facilitated by people in interreligious dialogue and other kinds of contexts today. Um, yeah. So are you talking about finding ways of institutionalizing or formalizing cross uh, cross church or interfaith? Well, I don't think it only has to be interfaith. I don't think it only has to be interfaith. On the contrary, I, mean, I think one of the things that Nancy invites us to do so beautifully is to think of all the collectivities in our life and finding ways of coming together to instead, instead of you know, suing each other over the schools cases and the healthcare cases and the prison cases, coming together to create excellent free public education and universal health care, instead of which I think we distract ourselves by sniping each, each other about these religion cases, which are not solvable. There's no way of, of actually ending this conversation. And I think it's irresponsibly distracting us from what we need to do. That's, that's how I feel. <laughs> Sorry, you invited me to say something so strong. No, that's, that's terrific. And it's, it's, uh, it's powerful coming from someone who spends so much time thinking about it. <laughs> um, all right, it is one o'clock. I want to thank you. This really has been extraordinary. I think a lot of people are, are wanting to rewatch and rethink and we'll be checking out your book because there's a lot to think about here. Um, thank you so much thank and thank you everybody for coming and we'll be back here same time next week with Ann Daly for a rather interrelated set of questions I think about um, religious liberty claims and abortion all right thank you so long take care <laughs>